for the organizers to have invited us here. I think the whole issue is about the time management, I suppose. And here is the situation where we all see in office practice children coming with fever and we need to exactly decide at what time we investigate, if at all, and what time we consider a specific management or otherwise. And I think in the next 20 minutes, I will go through uh, issues that probably will be useful for us in day-to-day -day practice. I think we, we need to realize that the provisional clinical diagnosis is a prerequisite of any further action. And I'm sure that if, if you have a situation where you don't have a provisional diagnosis at all, then what are you going to treat not investigate? You can't investigate a child first and then fit in your provisional diagnosis. That's what we always called as a misapproach, management first. If it does not work well, investigation next. If that doesn't give you a clue, then ask him what's wrong with you. How can I not understand, even if I manage? And I think we must have, in the morning, one of the sessions somebody put up to say that you must make a habit of writing a provisional diagnosis before your prescription. And I think that's very, very important. In absence of provisional diagnosis, I think many times we may not have a provisional diagnosis at all. In which case, I think the follow-up without specific treatment, only if it is safe to wait. Now, what is safe to wait? Safety is a relative concern. If you are staying in the building, the building may collapse any time. It's unsafe to stay in the building. Would be a pessimistic approach. An optimist will say building never collapse. Optimist is more likely to be right, often likely to be right, than a pessimist. And I think the safety is an issue. And we all understand that if it's a small infant under say three or six months, or if it's a very malnourished child, or is an immunosuppressed child, then of course fever becomes an unsafe situation. And therefore, if it is safe to wait, then of course you must wait. But if not, then of course other relevant tests before an empirical therapy. And I think this is an important message, that you cannot write an antibiotic without knowing why you are doing that. If you did not know that, at least if it was unsafe to wait, specific investigation to be sent out as a screening and then looked at that. I think the planned test should be able to guide further action. When you ask for a test, you need to ask yourself, what will I get out of that test? Would I get the help? Many times you must have seen your CVC sitting on the fence with some little neutrophilic leukocytosis and it means nothing to you. If that was so, then you would not have been even ordering such a test. And I think ideally a test should be confirmative. Well, not every time it's possible, but yes, you have a peripheral smear for malaria or a blood culture for typhoid, or at least supportive. You have a chest x-ray showing a pneumonia or a CSF showing some evidence of meningitis is reasonably supportive. But look at CBC, CRP, serology. They are almost never very helpful. If they are helpful, then the clinician should have understood them much before the tests even arrive. You don't want a ma massive neutrophilic leukocytosis to diagnose meningitis or pneumonia. You should have diagnosed them much earlier. Today, I understand that CRP is so commonly used. I personally do not understand why CRP is so often used. CRP to me is a sophisticated ESR. It does not tell you a great thing. It has limitation. Well, science has advanced. ESR takes a time. CRP comes early. But today you know, even you have a procalcitonin, which comes even before CRP. Tomorrow there will be a test which will tell you that your neighbor has an infection, so you may get it. I don't think we are going to believe on that. What does you, what do you get out of that CRP? Well, I understand that there could be a small way to look at CRP, but not just the whole beast on CRP. And I think to that extent, we need to look at how we should really decide whether to test, not to test. But as I said that you must have a provisional diagnosis anyway. Can you make a provisional diagnosis on a child who comes with fever for a day or two, or maybe a three or four? I'm sure nothing is sacrosanct in clinical medicine. And I think that's where its duty lies. That it's not like mathematics. And every time you learn out of your experience, and earlier we said that when you make a mistake, that's okay, but you need to learn out of it. 
this is the kind of a protocol that we have been following and it's reasonably useful. Nothing can be just sacrosanct as I said. I think we must assess the fever pattern. Onset of fever, response to antipyretic, that's paracetamol. Don't use nicer drugs. You know the nice drugs? Okay, they can bring down the fever of anyone and the disease can go on worsening as well. What's fever after all? Fever is the body's response to fight infection. You don't want to subdue fever just like that. But you certainly want to treat fever, not just to treat fever, but to treat discomfort arising out of fever. It gives you a lot of import interpretation if you look at how is the child behavior in the between interfebrile period. And then of course you want to see that fever is rhythmic or not. You want to look at the progress of fever and you want to see whether the fever has ultimately given rise to signs which are localized or really generalized. I think if we take care of these five, six situations in routine office practice, in the first few days of fever, you are almost reasonably sure whether you are dealing with either a viral infection, a bacterial infection or a malarial infection. We are not discussing about tuberculosis, we are not discussing about lymphomas or any other kinds of prolonged fever. That is a different ball game. But how do you look at a short term fever? You almost will know what it is. Look at the viral infection. Often starts with high fever at onset. Once the fever comes down, the child is all right. A very important information that you should gather from the parent that when the fever goes high, the child is irritable or lethargic. But how is the child when you give paracetamol? Oh, doctor, he just runs. He does not even rest. That tells you you don't have to worry at all today. And I think that's an important thing. How is the fever rhythmic? Gone are the days when you talked about continuous remittent intermittent fever. Today, everybody is intermittent. Because everybody is given paracetamol, ibuprofen, mephenemic acid, nimesolide if you like. And every continuous fever is made and no fever as well. So those things that do not help us. But asking the parent how often would you give paracetamol to a child and if the mother says every four to six hours, then you know it's a rhythmic fever. But sometimes the mother would say, oh I don't know, sometimes the whole 12 hours go without fever, but some other time every four hours I need to give. It becomes non-rhythmic fever. That's a rhythmic fever. And if this is so, a typical viral infection starting at the onset with high fever, in between fever the child is alright, it's a rhythmic fever. And I think by the time it's day four, day five, he's getting alright. Today we know that some of the viral infections go on even for a week or so. If one is very sure about what's happening on a repeated, very careful examination, you can even wait for a week without an antibiotic. But I'm sure all of us can wait at least for two, three, four days before we rush into an antibiotic. How does a bacterial infection look like? Bacterial infections have two types of presentation. One type of presentation is the bacterial infection enters at the site where it starts producing a disease right away like say a tonsillitis or a bacillary dysentery. It starts with high fever, almost like a viral infection. That's the bacterial infection at the site of entry. It's also rhythmic, but this child is going to be toxic, sick, ill, maybe bacteremic subsequently, maybe, therefore he's not going to be looking well in between fever. So even when the fever comes down a little, he's still appearing sick. And I think that's the point where you suspect that he is coming out with a bacterial infection at the side. This morning we heard that sometimes uh, the what looks like an enlarged tonsil with some specks there may not really need even a medication. But on other times, you could develop a big pus pockets on tonsil even on day three, day four. And uh, Jagdish told us this morning that there is no harm in waiting for a while. There is no risk of a rheumatic fever either even if you miss it. That's the rationality. But what about the other type of bacterial infection where the infection does not settle at the site of entry but goes through a bloodstream and then settles somewhere like a typical typhoid. And Anand mentioned a child where it starts with a moderate fever and here is the patient who comes to say that the fever was not so high in the first two, three days but became very high after three, four days. The child has been sick even in between fever and that's my bacteremic bacterial infection. And of course the malarial fever which is very erratic and we know all of that. 
to point, make it a point therefore is that every time you saw a child with fever in your office practice, you try to settle with simple observation whether this is likely to be one or the other. And unless you have a reason to consider a bacterial infection and further, if you have no time to wait, then only you would get into an antibiotic. I think once we understand this, let's see what's the average protocol of a time management. Let's look at the child with fever for first to two days. I think here diagnosis is often not possible. Let's not get away talking about some diagnosis to parent. It is better that they don't come to us in the first two days. But they happen to come to you. Today, the parents who are quite hyper would come to you at the first minute of fever if you are available. And they expect you to give them a diagnosis. Okay. There is no shame in telling them that there is still something evolving. When you see dark clouds in the sky, you are not sure whether it's going to rain. It may end up with a bright sunshine or it may flood. How would you know that? Would you open an umbrella because there are dark clouds? No. You would watch and wait and observe and be ready in case it starts raining. And I think that's the way I tell the parents that there have to be something evolving. And unless it evolves, nobody knows. It may be right to tell the parents that I do not know what is the cause of fever, but I know that there is nothing serious. Why nothing serious? Simple formulations of what makes the child look serious. You already said that if the fever comes down and the child still looks sick, you are worried. Most important is if the child is alert, if the child is passing in a furin, that means two organs are getting perfused well, the other organs we cannot make out bedside. I think that's enough to say that you are not heading for a trouble within the next two days. And I think that is the first two days where generally it's a period of no test and a period of no specific therapy. So what do you do in the first two days? Ideally, you don't even ask them to come to you and tell them to give paracetamol only and observe. Observe what? He should remain alert. He should pass enough urine. He should be reasonably good looking when the fever comes down. If this is so, wait for day three, day four. Don't be available for him to see you because you won't know what is wrong with him and he does not need you also to see him. But unfortunately, if he comes to you and unfortunately you give a drug, then the whole thing is going to be vitiated. And I think this is where we need to be very, very sure. If there is no seriousness, then what? why do we worry at all? Of course, if there are risk factors, then you may even hospitalize and send all the routine tests, etc. But in the first two days, it's a, two days, it's a time of no test, no therapy. And I think we should be very upfront in saying that. When it happens beyond that, you have a fever of day three, day four now, you have waited for first two days or they waited on themselves, then I think if the fever pattern is already changing, for example, when somebody comes on day four of fever and I say, how does the fever look like now? The mother would say, uh, earlier Dr. Paracetamol was not much working, every four hours I had to give. But now last eight, ten hours I have not given paracetamol. I think wait for another day or two. The trend of fever is already set in to improve. There is no hurry at all. But if that is not happening, then I think look for a localization. And I think generally localization would be seen clinically. You will see some subtle symptoms or signs of either a pneumonia, meningitis, UTI, etc. Common infection. You are not worried about not so common infection. Well, there could be a leptospira coming here. A dengue is already a viral infection. We already called it a viral. And to that extent, if we find that there is some localization coming up, then we wait. Otherwise, look for non-localizing infection like malaria typhoid. I'm just trying to take the most common ones there. And what do you see on day four? Either a respiratory, a CNS or a UTI and a non-localized malaria and typhoid. I want to get rid of these first. There are multiple infections. As you get super specialized, you know far more but they represent only small fraction of what you and me see. I don't have that much brain to remember all those. But if you remember few of them, 95% you are alright. But the problem is if you know too much, then you find everybody having too much of a problem. It doesn't happen that way. And I think therefore, if you look at those things, well, 
you could order then a relevant test. And if there is a possibility, you could even consider an empirical antibiotic. What kind of antibiotic? Again, in the morning I heard Jagdish talk about how to choose an antibiotic in an upper respiratory infection. And I think again, as a routine practitioner in office practice, you need just three or four antibiotics only. Don't bother about the newer antibiotics, their combinations, etc. Vancomycin, Piptas and Meropenem is not our key at all. I think we are happy with common antibiotic which serve 95% of the problem. And to that extent, we know that this is the way we will go on day 3, day 4. Well, you can even wait if you are very sure that there is nothing going to happen. And I think as the confidence build, probably you need to wait. Generally, parents would end up asking you, I hope nothing will go wrong. To which you should say, even I hope nothing will go wrong. But what hope? I know today there is nothing wrong. Okay, and we tell the parents what to look for and what to report and when to run. And I think if we say that, that's really more than enough. Now the fever has gone on for a week. Now this is the time where we might have to look a little more carefully. Because a, a child with one week's fever invariably must have had some antibiotic and must have had some common test and must have had made some provisional diagnosis which now the drug is not acting. This is the time of sometimes a repeat test. For example, if I had a CBC done earlier and I repeat after four days again, I might see the trend of the change in CBC and might get some idea where I am heading for. But if antibiotic is already on and the diagnosis is known, like I have a pneumonia, acute pneumonia, I have a neutrophilic leukocytosis, I waited for two, three days. By day 4, I picked up a pneumonia, chest x-ray, neutrophilic leukocytosis. I considered a community-acquired infection. I started a right dose of antibiotic. But at the end of another 3 days, there is no response. Then I want to look at, before I change an antibiotic, whether there are any other complications, like an empyema, for example, commonly. And I would rather ask for a chest x-ray or an ultrasound to pick up any small collection there, which must have been the cause of failure of antibiotic, rather than just a drug resistant infection and I think this is the way it would go on but suppose this child was having no diagnosis at all and still on an antibiotic which is what many times would happen then I think the problem is not very easy if the child is stable I might give another day or two for a nature or the same antibiotic to work if not I may have to consider a changing antibiotic changing antibiotic I think needs a lot of cautious approach if my first antibiotic has failed that means my th thought processes have failed. I can't fail the second time again. And I need to be very sure why I am giving the second change antibiotic, what that second change of antibiotic is taking care of organisms which my first antibiotic did not take care. It's not just upgrading the antibiotic. It's really widening the cover which was not probably covered by my first antibiotic. And I think this, we will have to give a, a correct thought beyond that. I think the fever has gone now beyond that. Now this is the time that I start looking at additional tests. So far I was just looking at my common CBC chest x-ray, urinalysis, blood culture, etc. And that has not paved the way. And I think by 10-14 days, if I have not diagnosed any bacterial infection, then probably I am going beyond my common bacterial infection drug resistant enteric fever or poorly managed typhoid fever is a possibility even at the end of two weeks or three weeks but the pneumonia meningitis UTI have all gone out now and therefore now you are looking something beyond now that beyond is a big list and I think you will have to again give a correct thought by then you have a 10-14 days of a long history to look back and you look back again and say did I miss some clue right to begin with how did it start how did it progress what has it done to the child's behavior? What has it done to the child's growth chart? Has he lost weight? Or is he active in spite of two weeks of fever? Not many such clues may give me an idea to which direction I should go on. And I think in that case, I, I look at common infection which go on beyond two weeks. And of course, many other complications. Sometimes the infection sets an immune mediated response. Like a streptococcus or a staphylococcal infection, which will come out with a streptococcal toxic syndrome and it will go on producing fever. You have a bacterial infection which sets up an immune response. 
like say an HLH, an immune response from the bone marrow, and the fever continues. An infection has probably even gone with your antibiotic, but an immune-mediated complications continue. But anyway, the fever continues. So one thinks about at this point of time whether it's the infection still on, if so, what infection, or whether it's an infection-induced immune or a toxic complications, which will go on on their own. We may not be able to exactly control them. To some extent we may, but an antibiotic is not going to help. And I think if not, then is it totally a different disease like a systemic inflammatory diseases or is it like a malignancy? So I think these thoughts start coming in. For example, today we know that a leptospira will have a second immune phase where an antibiotic alone is not going to solve your problem, but the child will keep on running fever, might get into a liver disease, a kidney disease, and still considered as failure of therapy. It's not necessarily a failure of therapy. It's a failure of host response. That is another thing at this point of time that you will have to consider. But in general, if two antibiotics have failed, then I think change the diagnosis only. Don't pursue uh, your further antibiotic course. Now fever has gone even beyond two weeks. Now consider all kinds of further rarer diseases in terms of common prevalence in office practice. And here you have of course the lymphoma, the leukemia, etc. I mean showed us some of the uncommon manifestations where it turned out to be a lymphoma, leukemia, etc. Histiocytosis, sarcoidosis, name anything. Point is that these diseases often have some time to kind of give us a thought process to work on. They rarely can be diagnosed on day one, day two or in the day first week either. And therefore, most of these illnesses are one of elimination. In other words, as the time goes, probably we move on on looking at something even much different, not common. And I think at this point of time, one should be very clear that one should stop antibiotic. I think stopping antibiotic is not a difficult decision. Having failed on two antibiotics and having failed to pick up any bacterial infection, why should we just continue some antibiotic? And I think at some stage, therefore, you should be bold enough to say there will be no antibiotic at all. And I think at the end of all that, one might even look at something very, very different, like say a periodic fever syndrome, central fevers, etc. There are often some clues. What are the clues really? I recall a child with a hypothalamic tumor who was running fever for a few months. But the parents would every time say that even if they give antipyretic, nothing happens. We did not take a note of that. Non-response to antipyretic is quite a hallmark of a central fever. And this is a child who is otherwise alright. He has not lost weight. He is in between fever alright. And I think that is the way we would even know sometimes these things. I think I would just end up by saying that a clinician must narrow down probable diagnosis before considering investigations or treatment. A word about the treatment of fever itself. I think when we talk about symptomatic treatment, we are really treating not the symptom but something that we have observed. What is the symptomatic treatment for fever? It's not paracetamol alone and we must know when to give it. Symptomatic treatment of fever is, what is the symptom? Fever is not a symptom. Irritability may be a symptom. Lethargy may be a symptom. Severe body headache may be a symptom. Fever is not just a symptom. Therefore, learn to treat fever only if there is a symptom of discomfort. Every time we must tell the parent that don't give paracetamol just because the temperature has gone up a little. Give paracetamol when the child is uncomfortable because of fever. Not just because he has fever. In fact, we should treat discomfort and not fever. How do you treat pain? By painkiller. Have you heard any painkiller really? Which drug kills the pain? No drug kills the pain. If I have a fracture, would some drug kill the pain? No. What is painkiller? A drug that makes me tolerate pain. Not kill the pain. What is antipyretic? It should be one that makes me tolerate fever. Not bring down fever. In fact, if we practice like this, we will get a clue from the pattern of fever as well. But you know, there are people who at 98.6 also will give paracetamol and then tell you that it does not work because the hypothalamic set point is already set higher and it does not care for your paracetamol. 
after paracetamol it goes up and the parents come and say nowadays metacin is causing higher fever shall i give another paracetamol that means he gave paracetamol when it was not required and i think we need to be very clear to tell the parent that don't treat fever treat discomfort of fever and if there is a discomfort you also know what the problem is there i think unexpected stress results must be cautiously interpreted in context of clinical profile don't catch a thief first and then find out in your house what is missing you may not find your pen that's not the thief how can you catch a thief first and then search your house does anybody do that now but if you go to a police station and come put up an fir to say i have lost my bag they will just take down and if you have if you know a police commissioner he will force them to find the thief also but you won't find your bag anyway i think you need to know what you are looking for in a test and you can't test it there is nothing like routine test who said this routine and is routine everything for every child no every child is different clinician must set that specific nothing routine there is no routine cbc routine cbc what is complete blood count does not give even incomplete interpretation what is cbc so don't go by that specific therapy should be prescribed only when documented reasoning which reasonably you know where it are i think symptomatic therapy as i already said that and i think lastly you must have a self audit and an introspection that is the only way i recall when my teacher retired and we gave him a farewell during his farewell speech he told us that he said from tomorrow i won't be here to ask you questions why you did this and why you did not do that so he said learn now to ask these questions yourself and answer yourself i think that's what we need to look at there is nobody around me to look at what i'm doing but i have a conscience to answer if i can answer that to myself then i suppose i will have a correct rationality thank you very much